Hello everyone, welcome to the stream. My name is Josh, also known as Vemiku here on Twitch. Today we're doing a bit of an interesting stream. We're not actually going to be playing really many video games, maybe, but that'll be later. But first, we're going to talk about sports. I know, a random sports stream in the middle of a variety game stream? What's happening here? Well, look, did you know, chat, I am actually a huge fan of sports, specifically soccer or football as is known across most of the world and it has a long and rich history of beautiful games beautiful gamesmanship and of course massive worldwide tournaments and if you know or have been paying attention to the football or soccer scene you know that the fifa women's world cup is actually just right around the corner starting this july 20th Will the U.S. be able to take another title and make World Cup history by being the first country in both men's and women's sports to take three World Cups in a row? Or will they be shut down by any of their major competitors? We will find out soon enough, but before then, what even is soccer? Can I even teach soccer to someone who isn't as knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the sport as others might be? We're going to find out today as I am joined by a very dear friend of mine, the creator of the Biodiversity Podcast, a master in ocean conservation and uh, biodiversity aid, an avid scuba diver, a D&D &D and board game and, and video game enthusiast, all of the above, the one, the only, Dane! How are you doing, buddy? Hey, man, how's it going? I'm good. Um, yeah, wow, what, what an introduction there. I am... Um... Yeah, I'm I'm doing great. I well, I'll talk your ear off about any of the things you mentioned. Scuba diving, I'm a huge uh, marine uh, fan, uh, but I know absolutely nothing about soccer. I was just at a soccer game the other day, and I was just like, "What am I watching?" <laughs> you are in fact watching sports, one of the oldest sports known to man, even starting in the ancient times of the Aztecs and Mayas, and being credited also in uh, China thousands of years ago. Right. So, uh, so it originated in, in um, Aztec Mayan area? Uh, part of it is believed to have originated around then. Uh, they played a game very similar to soccer. Um, I don't remember the exact name of it. Um, if you've seen the movie El Dorado, they did a fairly decent recreation of it. And the whole idea being that you had, couldn't use your hands and you had to pass a rubber ball around using your hips, shoulders, essentially anything but your hands and pop it into hoops that were suspended in the air, and if the ball touched the ground, it was considered dead and given to the other team. Uh, Wild. Yeah, I, original, I love that movie. That was great. Yes. Uh, the original uh, version that took place in China was actually a bit more classic soccer, as far as, I, as, far as I'm aware. Still had the idea that the ball couldn't touch uh, the ground. You still had to kind of play it in the air. But uh, instead of trying to get it through a hoop above you, you were just trying to get it into a standard goal, or at least as standard as goals can get uh, many years ago. Um, nice. History but, lesson alongside. I love it. Yes. Uh, but this, uh, just so everyone is aware, is not going to be any sort of formal training or anything. This is a very informal chat. We're just here to have some fun, teach some, teach about sports, and maybe get people excited for the upcoming World Cup, which you should definitely tune into July 20th. I'm not sponsored, but please watch the World Cup. It's such a beautiful event, and I love it dearly with all of my heart. <laughs> um, Absolutely. I mean, I... This is going to be like such a random tangent, but I know you and I, we both recently got into um, Omega Strikers. Um, yes. Wonderful free to play game. I cannot believe how much I actually love <laughs> this game. Um, but it was, it was in part because of that and in part because of uh, soccer events that I've gone to recently. That's like really made me realize how beautiful the, you know, sports in general, but like soccer specifically is and kind of the rules behind it. But I realized I just, I'm like, Man, I could tell you everything you need to know about fantasy things that don't exist, but like these things that really do exist, <laughs> clueless. And I mean, that's part of the human experience, you know. There's very few people that can go off on a on a tangent about any given subject. Uh, like if you told me to tell you about golf or even most of the basketball rules, there's no way I could do any of that. 
but similar to you, you put me into a Dungeons & Dragons theme, and I can tell you about the Sword Coast, I can tell you about Eberron, I can tell you about Icewind Dale, uh, I can tell you about Zendrick, and a little bit about uh, some other things in the world, overall world of Eberron. And I could tell you about football, and I could tell you about soccer. And those are kind of like the main niches that I hit in. Um, but I guess we'll go ahead and start with the basics. And I kind of figured, you know, what better way to teach soccer than to perhaps watch a soccer game? Oh, yeah, absolutely. If I can get my... <laughs> My stream is scuffed. <laughs> scuffed already. Here we go. <laughs> I'm going to cover you up for just a moment while I try and get this goodbye, goodbye. sorted. As you can see, totally professional stream going on here. Whoa. We have audio, but no image. <laughs> Lovely. Ah, this was literally just working five minutes ago. <laughs> it's the old uh, GDQ, the Games Done Quick thing. This has never happened before. Come on. Uh, it's not that this has never happened before. It's that this has happened all too often with this stupid thing. Well, you know what? We're going to go like this. So that we can still see your lovely face. And why don't you tell them a bit about your glorious podcast? Uh, so I run a um, marine kind of biodiversity and creature feature based podcast. Um, I've always been very passionate about the ocean. I got certified as a diver when I was 12 and kind of as I started exploring uh, coral reefs and other ecosystems that exist beneath the waves, I was just so captivated by the wildlife that really exists underneath the water. Um, and it, it's actually funny because Josh, you're a part of this story. Um, if you remember back <laughs> in the early days, I would always find something really cool about like uh, an ocean animal, like an octopus or these small, tiny little microscopic organisms called foraminifera um, that are literally are responsible for coloring some beaches pink. And it's just like these wild things about nature. And I would just get super excited about them. And I would end up texting, texting you and a bunch of our other friends, just these long paragraphs about just these, these cool things. Um, and while I appreciate you all, all humoring me, um, because I did that, um, it made me realize that I just I really like telling telling stories about cool creatures, especially cool ocean creatures. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided, especially when COVID hit, to take that into a, a personal project and try to make a podcast, um, which I've been doing for the past couple of years, and actually helped inspire me to go back to graduate school um, to study marine conservation and biodiversity. So. It's really cool. You should go check it out. I haven't posted in a while because I've been in graduate school, but I basically pick an animal every week and talk about the cool science and superpowers that that animal has and try to tell a story. And it's a good time. So come, come and check it out. I mean, I don't think anyone can blame you at all for being in graduate school while taking a break from your podcast. I mean, that's quite <laughs> quite the undertaking in and of itself. Well, I appreciate that. We do live in the production generation, though. We gotta, you know... <laughs> if, I, if my resume mentality. doesn't say that I produced, you know, podcast on top of going to graduate school, then what good <laughs> am I? But, no, nah, instead you were kidding. working on another project, which I won't spoil for the viewers just yet, but mm. hopefully in the near future you will see something incredible out of my dear friend here uh, coming down the pipeline. So excited to see it... Uh, in its continuation, if you intend to actually continue working on said unnamed project. 100%. Uh, but with that, I finally got my capture card working again. Huzzah! Uh, so we're going to... Uh, this is uh, FIFA 2020, I believe. Um, okay. 
since I don't think I can stream any actual games, <laughs> I'm instead going to stream a simulated game uh, between my personal favorite team, Arsenal, and the team that just barely beat us in the last season of the Premier League, Manchester City. You <laughs> dirty, uh, you know, you played well. I, I respect your team, but how dare you? <laughs> Um, so we're just going to have this uh, going in the background while we kind of discuss here so that people can. What? What is that? <laughs> no, just play the match. Welcome to you all to the Emirates Stadium. Martin Tyler here along with all right, we're going <clears> to <throat> lower our game sound here. That way it's not too overbearing on anyone. So. Soccer is a very technical game and less of a flashy game. So sports like uh, American football and even rugby, they're all about these powerful shows of force and they're all about um, getting lots of points. Even, even basketball nowadays is a very showy, quick game. And you would think a game where the clock never stops would be quick, right? As not, well, I mean, that's not exactly the case in soccer, because while the clock never stops for anything or any reason, the game is a lot more about the technical aspect. There's a lot of uh, positioning that comes into play. As you can see on the screen, we can get a little glimpse of some of the positioning of the players. And how that plays into uh, the game itself is players are differentiated into different positions. You've got your goalie who is in the back, defenders who are in the uh, defenders in the next line, midfielders in the next line, and your forwards up front. <clears throat> and different uh essentially levels of skill are required for each position. Uh, generally on your team, you have a uh, striker who they are your main scoring player. They're the ones that have the best ability to score on your team generally and usually want them up in a forward position so that they have those opportunities to make goals. Assisting, there's, there's only one striker. There can be multiple strikers. Um, but they are your main scorekeepers. Sometimes it's one, yeah. sometimes it's two. Um, <clears throat> you can have up to, or you will generally see up to about four players in that kind of forward position. Um, two of them will usually be set as wings on either side of the field so that they can cross the ball uh, to the strikers to kind of try and juke out the goalie a little bit. Um, but anyone, anyone in soccer can score. Um, there is nothing saying that the goalie can't run to the other end of the field and shoot the ball into score. Not mm. always the best idea, but it is something that can happen. What? This yeah. isn't Omega Strikers and you're playing Asher? Come on. <laughs> this is totally Omega Strikers and I'm playing Asher. Uh... Behind your forwards, you have your midfielders. Their job is to assist both the forwards and the defenders, depending on where the ball is on the pitch or the field. Mm -hmm. So they need to have a lot of endurance to be able to run back and forth quickly. They need to be able to make quick bursts of speeds and be able to intercept the ball and uh, think quickly. And uh, how dare you, Manchester City? We'll get into how scoring works <laughs> in a moment. But you can see that, of course, my team just got scored on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, your midfielders have to be able to move around the pitch really quickly and essentially chase the ball down to get either possession for your team or to give your forwards the opportunity to make those plays to make goals against the enemy team. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then behind them, closer it's to the goal, you have your... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, just a lot of positioning, it sounds like, in, yes. in the infield. Yep. Yeah, you definitely need players with a lot of high endurance uh, capabilities to be in the midfield. 
because well, because yeah. a, a soccer field is not small like it is not when i went went to a game recently i was really struck by that i was just like man there's a big field there's a lot of running there is a lot of running that occurs in a general soccer field um there are in fact i believe i have some stats here on the field size uh So a regulation field is between uh, 100 and 120 yards long and 70 Jeez. to 80 yards wide. That's huge. They are. It is a massive field. Um, and the entire field is used for the entire match. As you can kind of see in the game, they've already been swapping sides uh, from the far side to the close side. Obviously, they've been running to either end. It takes a lot to move around these fields, get yourselves positioned correctly, and uh, just be able to maneuver the ball around the field to be able to outmaneuver your opponents and get into the positioning you need to be able to take your opportunities to score. Absolutely. Um, Wild. So the second to last position is are the defenders. They are the second to last line of defense between the opposing team and your goal. Uh, so you want players who have the ability to move quickly to intercept positions and have a critical thinking mind to be able to know where they need to be positioned at any given time during the game for the best chance of stopping the opposing offense from getting to your goal. And you can kind of see here Manchester C in the blue here in this game. Their defense is kind of is essentially doing kind of a one on one positioning against Arsenal's offense. You'll see a lot of mm -hmm. uh, players on the blue team guarding players on the red team and following them about the field. And that's so that yeah, you, yeah. you're trying to not leave anyone unguarded. That makes at sense. any given time. Similar thing happens in uh, basketball. Yep. Which is like a sport I did sort of used to play. But. Yep. In basketball, it's called man-to-man uh, -man defense. I believe it's called the same here in soccer. I don't exactly know that. Um, but generally, it's you're trying to cover all of your bases as well as anyone who is not doing a job of covering is standing in the way of the goal to try and block direct shots, but also trying not to get in the way of the goalie. Uh, which is the last major position in soccer and probably the most important player in soccer. Um, goalie sits in front of the goal and they are the last line of defense for your team to not get scored upon. They are the only uh, player in the game who is allowed to use their hands while within a specific area. They can't use their hands outside of the uh, goal box to pick up the ball and is, is the goal box the one that's, that's smaller in front of the goal or is it that whole big rectangle so i actually have a where'd it go i have a diagram Oh, I love diagrams. <laughs> You're very much appealing to my scientist heart. So apologies to those who are watching uh, the actual game in the background. We will get back to it shortly. Trust me, it's still going on. So what you can see here, this large rectangular box is the goal box. Oh, so okay. this so is the area. That, that's a wide area. Okay. It is a massive area where the goalie can uh, use their hands to pick up the ball. Um, there are a couple rules with that, um, that I haven't fully grasped. There's something about, uh, if the goalie, like, kicks the ball initially, then they're not able to grab it with their hands, and a few strange, uh, things like that. It's usually not a big deal, um, the goalies and the players know their roles well enough that 
they're not going mm. to make a stupid mistake like that and allow the enemy team a chance to score um, by giving away a penalty. But we'll get to uh, penalties in a little bit. So this is the basic layout of the field. So this distance along here would be your 100 to 120 yards, while the distance along here would be your 70 to 80 yards. Mm -hmm. um, we have a midfield barrier here that separates the two teams' sides of the field, and that is important for uh, determining penalties and when a team is on the offense versus defense in technicality. Mm -hmm. Um, we, this go, did you have a question? <laughs> no, 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 I'm just generally okay. commenting that, that that makes sense. And feel free to interrupt me and just blast away with questions. Otherwise, I will just be talking this entire stream and nobody wants that. <laughs> oh, don't you worry. Don't you worry. Uh, in the center of the field here, we have uh, this center field ring, which is a 10 meter ring around the very center of play and that comes into play during the initial kickoff and uh, kickoffs after a goal. Um, whichever team was originally scored upon will be able to send up to two players into the center to do the initial kickoff. Everyone else has to stand outside of that 10 meter ring. OK, OK, that makes sense. Um, I a lot of them... positioning to me is very arcane, so this is this is nice. Yes. Um, so to kind of get into that positioning again, kind of if you kind of remember how we saw when the teams were initially setting up and they had like the one goalie, the Manchester had the one goalie, the four defensemen, uh, two midfielders and three forwards, I believe it was. No, we're missing one. Mm -hmm. Four defensemen, three midfielders and four forwards. Yeah, that would three be forwards. Way. It's a three, three, four combo. So position, uh, not positions. Um, there's a word for this that I'm missing. It's on the tip of my tongue. Ha. Uh, Come on, I teach. I have, I have a cheat sheet. Where's my cheat sheet? <laughs> Formation. That's the one. So you have 11 players each team can have up to 11 players on the field at any given time. Um, if you have any more than that on the field, uh, you can get an automatic penalty. You can have less than that uh, based off of penalties. We'll get into that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you teams will try to set up a for, uh, formation depending on what they're trying to do at any given point in the game. So if you want to be attacking, you'll have like a... Uh, 4-4-2 formation where you have um, four forwards, four midfielders, and two defenders. If you want to be a little bit more defensive, you uh, could do like a 3-2-5 formation where you have five defenders, two midfielders, and three forwards. It's kind of this mix of how you want to play the game is how you're going to set up your players in a formation to either attack or defend the ball. If that makes so, sense. so who who it does who makes those calls? I mean, is, there, is it like the coach on the side that's that's helping? Be like, okay, we're against a team that seems to be hyper offensive. Let's shift into a more defensive sort of thing. Is, I mean, yeah, I guess it's like who who makes those calls and how often does I guess the formation change? I feel like it's kind of a stupid question. So initial formations are usually set uh, by the coach working with an. Uh, with a coordinator who is going to kind of who has kind of looked at the opposing team, looked at some of their strategies and kind of plan around them and how they want to go about the game. A team who might want to take the game slower in the beginning might set up a bit more defensively at first. Uh, whereas a team that wants to be a powerhouse attacking in the beginning of the game is going to set up more offensively. Um, generally, formations only change uh once during the game they'll be set at the beginning of the game and then they'll change at half um the key thing though is that yeah. soccer is fluid it's a very fluid game so unlike uh 
games like football where you have essentially a lineup and set plays that you're doing every single down soccer since the clock's always running play is pretty much always going so you need players on the field who can call to make quick changes like hey our, this forward needs to start staying back more as more of a midfielder and this midfield need midfielder needs to start staying back more as an actual defender because we're we keep getting beat and that's mm -hmm. where the captain comes into play so there is a coach and a captain the captain is an actual player on the field you must have a captain on the field and they are usually uh, usually de uh, designated by a captain's my mic is in the way by a captain's armband uh, okay. so that the referee knows who the captains are on each team okay that, that's something i'll have to look for uh, next next match i go to is, is there only one like how many players are actually on a team because i mean I'm, I'm assuming players change out during the game if there's 11 on the field is it like 20 people on the team does that vary is it like so per world cup rules a team is allowed to bring uh 26 players to the world cup i believe um and they they will uh rotate out rotate out rotate out uh for injuries uh if players have different styles that might work against different teams they might rotate in uh game by game dependent um, and they might rotate out as substitutes when players get exhausted. Right. But even throwing in substitutes is an interesting mental game because you only get, I believe it's, uh, three substitutions per half. I'm trying to double check really? this. That seems low. I mean, arbitrarily, knowing nothing about soccer, that seems low. I'm trying to double check this number, but um, that that is one of the key things is you have. Uh, so the maximum number of substitutions for competition play is five. So for, for the entire yeah. game, you get five substitutions. And so that that becomes very important. And that's why you have, especially in your midfielder, your midfielders who are constantly running back and forth and trying to cover both sides of the game. You definitely need to have players with a lot of endurance uh, capabilities so that they can actually make those plays constantly be out on the field, because if one of your players gets injured, that's one of your substitutions gone. Yeah, yeah. Regardless, well, I of... imagine it takes. Yeah, I imagine it takes you know time too, and you said that the clock doesn't stop, which is is something that I I recently learned with having going having gone to a game recently. Um, so I imagine like swapping out also takes time. Question mark. Yep. So, the clock stopping is a very fundamental part of soccer. There's actually a lot of team strategy that goes into the clock not stopping. And that's where we get into start getting into uh, penalties out of bounds and substitutions a little bit more in depth. Um, we'll swap back to the game here. Which so I just just actually... for clarity, I believe that... Um... The length is 90 minutes, right? That's the, the length of a soccer game. Yes. So uh, each half is split into uh, 45 minutes for a 90 minute game plus stoppage time. So mm -hmm. anytime there is a stoppage of play, the referee, um, which I, I didn't even get into the referees, so I'll touch on those real quick. There are. Uh, there is one referee in a game of soccer and two assistant referees for a total of three people watching over the game. 
Um, now with technological standards, we technically have a fourth referee who is watching over the video of the game, but they only give their opinions if called upon during the game. And even in, the, even in those points, the main referee will usually go off the field to overlook the video footage and make a call there. Mm. Um, so there is one person who is actually able to make calls and essentially determine both the pace of the game and the length of the game. Um, so you have one referee who runs about the middle of the field and two assistant referees, one on each side of the field. And you so, can kind so of see... You can kind of see one of them in the top left corner there in the yellow jersey, now hidden behind the points total. Mm -hmm. um, so the assistant referees on either side, essentially one will be uh, on the far side of the field covering the left half. The other will be on the near side of the field covering the right half of the field. And they're, the main thing they're looking for is a penalty called offsides, which we will get into later but they can kind of signal with a flag when they see a penalty happening to try and signal to the main referee that hey something happened over here if they think it's necessary to call the attention of the main referee is that the yellow and black checkered flag or is that something different yep that's the yellow and black checkered flag in in this instance it's not always going to be yellow and black it might just be a uh, it might be a yellow and red. It's it's going to be some noticeable color. Um, yeah. For the instance yeah. of the match opinion. we're seeing here, uh, the main referee is the person in yellow that you can see basically in the middle of the screen there. And they are constantly moving with the players, so they also have to have a lot of stamina. And they are constantly keeping an eye on the ball and the action to try and spot fouls and when a ball goes out of play. Um, to go out of play, a ball either has to go, it, it essentially has to go outside of the field. The entirety of the ball has to be outside of the field. And which side of the field it goes out on makes a difference. So if it goes out of the field on the long side, it is a throw in. And if it goes out of the field on the short side without going in the goal, it is either a goal kick or a corner kick, depending on the last team that touched the ball. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. In because I was I was so confused about that when I was watching the last soccer game about when it was being thrown in versus like what or when when a corner kick happened, and I still am very confused about what the difference. I guess or I guess like what advantage I guess a corner kick gives you versus like when a goal kick is called. So I'm assuming we'll get into that, but yep. So we can actually get into that uh, right now. So the one of the main things that those um, sideline reps or the assistant referees are watching is for which team touched the ball last. Mm -hmm. um, so in the instance of a th throw in the last team to touch the ball, uh, allows the other team the chance to throw in the ball. So in this, so with the two teams we have here, if Arsenal were to kick the ball out of the, uh, they're uh, out of the field, out of the field on the long side, Manchester city would get the throw in. Right. Right. That makes sense. And that's like one of the weirdest or one of the few rules of soccer I remember from like when I, you know, played in elementary school in the gym. Yep. And that can have a lot of strategic impacts in it for throwing specifically, um, because if you can kick the ball off of your opponent and send it out of bounds to stop their advance, that gives your team time to uh, get into play, get into position to defend or respond in an attacking manner if you got the throw in off of them. But it's essentially pausing play without pausing time to give your team the ability to get into position because the that enemy team, sense. the opposing team now has to go get the ball, run up and do a throw in, which to do a throw in both. Hand, see, oh, that was a burp. 
both hands have to be on the ball and both feet have to be on the ground mm -hmm. at the time the ball is thrown. Um, that is how to do a legal throw in. So obviously you're limited in the distance and power you can get from a throw in. So usually you're trying to get play uh, your teammates to get up close to you so you can actually get the ball to them without it being interrupted or have the chance to be interrupted by the opposing team when you're doing a throw in. So there's a lot of uh, time mentality that goes into is like the defenders and midfielders saying, should I try and just get this out of play so my team can get back into position? Or do I think I can take this guy, get the ball from him, leave my team in the attacking position and be able to get the ball up to the rest of my team to potentially score a goal while the opposing team is out of position. Yeah, I think that's one of the coolest things I think that like I'm starting to realize as I get older about sports is just there's so much strategy and like thinking involved about your positioning, about being able to take your opponents. And it's just it's it's honestly really fascinating. I didn't really realize that there was so much to it when I was growing up. Absolutely. And in my opinion, soccer is one of the best games to watch to see that kind of strategic mentality occur. Even when it's taken a little bit too far in the form of penalties. But we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll again get to that later. Um, there's a lot of stuff that happens with penalties. And uh, I, I kind of want I, I'm going to get through the rest of the basics of the game <laughs> and we'll get to the penalties. Um, so going back to uh, out of bounds play. So we've covered throw ins. The other parts are uh, corner kicks and goal kicks. So if the yeah. def if the uh, offense was the last team to touch the ball and it goes beyond that end line uh, without going into the goal, it is a goal kick. Again, the same kind of theory applies as throw ins. The last team to touch the ball, the opposing team gets the opportunity. OK, that makes sense. So if the offense hits the ball past the end line, the defense gets a goal kick, which allows them to essentially reset play, gives them control over the ball and gives puts themselves is able gives them the ability to put themselves in an advantageous point or advantageous pos position to go and try and score a goal. And, and, and the goal kick. Can, can you just walk me through exactly what a goal kick is? Yes. So for a goal kick, um, it looks like the game just ended. <laughs> Perfect timing. So for a goal kick, we'll go back to our diagram here. So you can see these uh, smaller boxes outside of the field. Those are our goals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is what is called the end line. In between our goal is called the goal line. So a goal kick uh, the ball can be placed, I believe, anywhere along this kind of center rectangular square here. Okay. And usually the goalie can take the kick, but I believe defenders can as well. They'll essentially get to place the ball somewhere along this line, back up and just wail on it. Get it to the other side of the field, or try to anyway. You can try to get to the other side of the field. You can pass it to a short defender who's uh, able to take it and then make a play up the field. Um, the whole idea is you're essentially getting the chance to get the ball into whatever position is favorable for your team. Um, I don't know the uh, exact ruling on this, but the opposing team... I believe uh, cannot be it's either can't be within the goal box or on the defensive half of the field. I don't exactly remember. I believe it's can't be within the goal box uh, during a goal kick. Um, but more often than not, even with that, you'll see the in professional play, you'll see the uh, opposing team from a goal kick back up so that they are in a defensive position just in case that uh, goal kick goes way over across the midway of the field 
the defending team, the now defending team, and still has a chance to recover the ball and make a play with it, rather than having two people way out of position over here. Ah, okay. So, so then the opposite of that, well, I guess not opposite, but you know, reverse of that being the corner kick, yep. um, which would be if the defenders, I guess, kick it out of bounds, then then the attackers would line up at those corners there and, and do the corner kick. Yep. So if a defender kicks it out of their kicks it past their own end line, uh, then the offense team gets to make a corner kick where they will take the ball and they can place it anywhere in this uh, anywhere within this arch here, which is a one meter arch, one meter radius arch in the corner. Um, corner kicks are a very good opportunity for the offense to actually score a goal because they are is most often what you'll see is they will set and send one player to set the ball in this position where they can kick it easily with their dominant foot and they will cross the ball up towards one of try and get to essentially a mass of their players, which is all crowded around in here, who are going to try and scrum to hit the ball into the goal. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I do recall seeing a lot of that happening. Yep. In the game I went to. So it's it's corner kicks are very stressful for the defense. They're very stressful for the offense as well. But it's the it's some of the best opportunity the offense is going to get to actually get a goal. Um, aside from so a so penalty if you're a defender, kick, you really want to try you, to avoid that. You really want to try to avoid that. Um, which uh, back when I used to play um, defender, one of the things we would uh, try to do is when the opposing team was dribbling near us, kind of on the end zone, we would try to kick the ball off of their shin. So it ricocheted off of the offense and out of bounds, giving us a goal kick mm. because it touched the offense last. That's wild. That yep. is wild. Um, you don't see that as much in professional play, um, probably because it's a bit of a risky move if it goes wrong. Um, yeah. But definitely in like minor league play and even kids play, you'll you'll see them try to pull that. <laughs> um, hmm. well, the main thing technically correct, the best kind of correct. Yeah, the main thing with corners is that uh, your offense can be anywhere on the field for a corner kick. So you can have people standing literally on the goal line. Mm -hmm. Ready to just headbutt that sucker in. Uh, and so it's it's becomes very stressful, especially for uh, the goalie, because they, they can use their hands, which usually means they're going to be going up to try and block the ball with a fist or an open palm, just something to get it out of their goal zone as quickly as possible. Mm. It's, they got to be careful to not punch anyone in the head because that's a problem. Yeah. 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 So, also, so I, have, I have another question sort of related yeah. to that, but go ahead and finish your, your sentence. I, I was just going to say, uh, but also uh, in that on that same note, if you're on the offensive field team, you don't really want to get punched in the head either. So you're not going to mm -hmm. risk your noggin for a potential penalty kick. That's just not going to happen because you got a whole 45 minutes game left to play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I at the game that I was at, there were a couple of times, I mean, it wasn't in this particular scenario, it was a different scenario, but people, um, you know, two of them were jumping up to try to header it at the same time. And I mean, they just boom, like wrapped yep. into each other's skulls. But, you know, like you said, it was weird because they literally just like dusted themselves off and were just like, all right, let's, let's keep going. But that, I mean, that hurt. Like they showed it on the replay cam and that looked like it hurt. Um, but my, my question, I guess, comes in, are there rules surrounding one of the things that I saw, and even in the stream that you were showing here is the goalie, like literally like grenade jumping onto the ball and, and taking it. Are there rules surrounding when they can and can't do that? Like, you know, just grabbing the ball and like putting it underneath them and just like going on top of it. 
So that's they as long as they are within that uh, goalkeeper area, the large box around the goal, they can use their hands to grab the ball. And sometimes that does mean kind of grenade jumping on the ball, um, because even if you put your hands on it until the ref blows the whistle saying to kind of back off to the opposing team, if someone comes up and kicks it out of your hands, it's fair game. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 It doesn't that, happen that often because it, it again doesn't happen as often in uh, pro matches because if you miss the ball and kick the goalie in the face, that's a major penalty. Probably going to get you a yellow card or if not a red card, and uh, those are bad. Those are real bad. You don't want those. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, that ball is live until the ref blows the whistle kind of stopping play and giving the goalie the ability to get up from said situation and play the ball. Um, well, that, that makes a lot of sense because one of the things that happened in the game that I was watching was that they would jump on it and then the goalie would just kind of sit there on top of the ball for what to me seemed like an exorbitantly long period of time. But now that makes yep. sense if she was waiting for, for the whistle to blow. And so they're actually doing two things with that. One, they're protecting the ball and waiting for the whistle to blow. And two, they're burning time. Yeah, 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 yeah. So anything that you're, especially when you're in the lead, anything that your team can do to waste time without, without it being from penalties or uh, out-of-bounds play is good because you are giving the you are forcing the opponent to have less time to make a play against you i feel like that's almost opposite thinking from a lot of other sports it but is I, I could be wrong it's it's very interesting it's it's very much opposite thinking especially from a sport like um basketball or uh football where as soon as so basketball is the big one. As soon as your team has the ball, you have, I believe it's a 30 second shot clock to be able to go and make a shot to try and get a basket. That's not the case in yeah. football. There's no shot clock. There's no timer on your team except that 45 minute half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you are able to take an early lead and then stall for the entire match, that's a win. Yeah, no kidding. And that's also why you'll never really see high scoring soccer games. A scoring is really hard. There's a lot of mentality that has to go into scoring. There's a lot of positioning that has to go into scoring. Uh, but B, you don't really need that many points. So many soccer games yeah. are won off of a single goal, a one to nothing game that it's it, it's just play, it's just mental play. Yeah. OK, that makes a lot of sense. And that it's all in that big factor of the clock does not stop. It makes for such interesting play and such interesting strategy that is what I think really endears me to soccer. <laughs> There's yeah, so much thinking I... that goes into the game beyond the surface. And it's, it is unfortunate to me that most people just kind of see soccer, especially here in the U S I know this isn't the case around most of the world is one of, I believe it is the actually the most popular sport in the world. Um, but yeah, here in the U S yeah. it, has not gained a lot of traction because it is seen as a boring game because it's not flashy. There's it's not goal after goal after goal after goal after goal or points after points after right. points or points. There's no watching big numbers get bigger like you have in football or in basketball, even in baseball, where you've got these high flying moments of a ball going straight out of the field and getting a home run for your yeah. team is this big explosion of a moment that's happening it's every single lighting. inning. Uh, yeah. Ending in a point to ending in a game of like 10 to seven yeah, in yeah. soccer. 
if you get that's why you'll see when a team gets a goal in soccer the entirety of the team the entirety of the fans erupts because mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. so less common than in any other yeah, sport. I mean, it, and, and it's wild i mean i think i'm i'm certainly subject to a lot of those same thought processes that you just talked about right because i mean on the surface without this context it's it's very different like yeah the numbers are not getting bigger and like also one of the weird things that struck me as when i tried to play soccer like back in in elementary school is like the goals are pretty big and like the goalie Mm -hmm. is not that big so i always thought it was like super easy to score goals um but realizing that it's not and seeing games played where it's really not it's it's just not obvious and it's i don't know it's it's cool to think about on 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 that point as well the mindset of a goalie if when you actually listen to the kind of training that they go through and how their minds actually have to work for games it's a little insane because majority of the time the goalie is I, I, okay, I shouldn't say majority of the time. Probably about 50% of the time, the goalie is not reacting. They're being proactive. Mm-hmm. Because the goal is so big and because they have such a small frame comparatively and because they're the only player that can actually use their hands, they you will a, a lot of times see this when it actually comes down to penalty shootouts. If the goalie sees a player coming at them with the ball, they will mentally pick a direction, try and position themselves to make that direction seem more appealing to the player so that they will kick it in that direction and dive that direction before the player even kicks the ball because that's their yeah. only chance at actually blocking the goal. God, that's wild. That is like levels of mental play that I've only seen in competitive Pokemon. It, <laughs> it is a mental chess match between the goalie and the defender cranked up to a hundred when it's a penalty kick. Dang. Okay. Wild. That's so cool. Yeah. It it's such a cool and beautiful game. There's so much strategy that goes into it. That is honestly like even watching this match here, I'm sure a lot of people that are watching this are just kind of seeing and going, well, run around, kick stuff. That's not that hard. And it's Sure, it's a physically exhausting task, but there's so much mentality going behind it. You're checking all of your other players anytime you have the ball. Who can I pass it to? Who's not being covered? Is there anyone going to be able to intercept my pass if I try to cross it over to this person? Where is the rest of my team in case it gets intercepted when I cross it? There's and if you don't have the ball, you're watching these players being like, how can I get open? Where can I get to so that? They know they can get it to me so I can get to someone else to score or where can I go so that they can set up the cross so I can score. There's so much mentality. Mm -hmm. There's so much coordination that has to happen most of the time without words. Uh, Like you'll hear a lot of shouting if there wasn't a crowd of people saying like here open or pass or go or stuff like Mm -hmm. that. But you also don't want to drown out the captain because the captain's trying to make those important calls of, hey, switch back to defense. Hey, come up to forward. Yeah, there's a lot of intuition. There's a lot of thinking. There's a lot of situational awareness going on in it. While the whole time you're kicking a ball with your foot that you're not even able to touch with your hands. The ball is constantly in motion throughout (laughs) the game. You have no control over that sucker except what you can do with your foot. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. Well, on all these decisions that you're talking about, like, and, and like all this situational awareness and everything, I mean, to me, that's happening in a split second. Like the, the mm-hmm. mental processing, I mean, I'm going to keep relating this back to Omega Strikers. And I'm sorry, <laughs> but you can't stop me. Hey, hey <laughs> you know what? Relate like, away. I love that game. It's so good. Um, but like, that is only a 3v3 game, mm-hmm. right? And I have trouble mentally keeping track of the positions of six people the two other people on my team my person and the three on the other team it's like that's hard to make decisions on a relatively small map with relatively small numbers of players and and to see it amplified 
to this this degree and giving me a lot of new respect i tell you mm -hmm. that and like you said like you said that's just like watching six players even not including the goalies in a soccer match especially the captains you're trying to keep track of 20 people wild <laughs> It's insane. The, the, the mental capacity is, is is beyond me. I mean, I may it's, be smart in science, but dear Lord, would I be dumb on a soccer field? It's it's literally insane. And there is a point on there is a point in uh, practice where that. Doing those drills and knowing uh, positions and knowing different plays that your team can pull be, has to become second nature yeah because uh, because of how much that mental how much of your mental fortitude trying to keep track of all of that takes there has to be a point where you have to trust that the rest of your team knows where to be and what to do at any given time huh. so being in practice knowing like okay if uh, this player has the ball and they're over on the right side of the field. We've drilled this so many times. I got to be towards the center of the field so that they can cross it to me and I can score that. That just becomes your instinct. You see, they have the ball. You go to center instinctually. Yeah. So you can try to make that play. It's yeah, absolutely man, wild. Yeah. Yep. It's absolutely wild. And in the, and depending on what team you're playing, you might not know what the enemy team is doing at any given time. So you don't know if they're setting up for something unless you've watched them repeatedly. Yeah, oh, they just OK, I, I got to stop here. Uh, oh, I okay. missed it. Okay. So um, be, part of that also mental play and part of that positioning, uh, we're going to start getting into penalties. And yes, we are, I'm very curious. We are going to start with one of the most ridiculous rules in soccer. <laughs> that I totally understand why it exists. And I agree that something like this needs to exist. But it's one of those instances where a rule wasn't stated and it backfired on what it was supposed to do in my opinion all right hit me with it. it is the offsides rule this is both one of the most confusing rules in all of soccer and kind of one of the most annoying rules in all of soccer so how offsides work and i wish I could go back to that replay that they had because it actually showed it. Can I? Dang, OK. Um, oh, wait, maybe I could, maybe it shows it in this instant replay. Way back game, way back. So essentially offsides is an anti cherry picking rule. Do you know what cherry picking is? In the context of a political arena about facts. Uh, not so much that. <laughs> um, <laughs> dang it, I don't have enough free. No, it's to it's to like I'm five. Um, so I'm going to uh, do it instead with this visual aid. And hopefully I have some sort of marking tool. Aha, OK. So how offsides work is if an offensive player is past the defensive line, when they are past the ball, they are offsides. Say that again. An offensive player past the defensive line. Yep. So we're going to use uh, blue for defense and red for offense for the sake of this example okay. so you've got your goalie back here at the goal and you've got your 
let's say four defensive players usually set up in some sort of line like this yeah makes sense and the offensive team back here has the ball let's say uh this one here has the ball okay. and while they have the ball this other player decides to run up to here. If this person now kicks the ball to this player who is behind the defensive line, this player is offsides and the it is uh, counted as a penalty. Okay. So would it have been offsides if it hadn't crossed the, the midfield line? Uh, so let's say this player decides to dribble the ball up. So they're now here with the ball. And this player is still behind the defensive line and they pass it across to this player that is still offsides. The key, the only thing that matters in offsides as far as ruling it is the position of this farthest back defensive player oh okay so it's like a moving line target yep wild okay so there's yep. like no benefit to trying to get behind the enemy defensive team and try to get the ball in an effort to score nope because then that's just offsides. However, the other key point is that the ball was passed from in front of that defensive line to behind that defensive line to a player who was behind that line when the ball was passed. So, so if they were in front of the line, the ball was passed, they run behind the line to receive it, that's fine? That's a fair play. God, what? That is wild. And if this player dribbles the ball past the defensive line and then passes to this player, that's a fair play. Okay. So so what was this, this is why... meant to prevent again? The, the, the cherry picking. What? So what it's so, plain. What, plain. so what cherry... America. Yes. So what cherry picking is is it it, it is almost exactly this situation it is sending a player to sit behind the enemy lines i i'm making gestures with my hand that you can't even see it's sending one player to sit behind enemy lines so that the rest of the team can pass the ball over the enemy lines to that player mm. to give them a 1v1 oh, against the goalie gotcha that's cherry picking gotcha okay so offsides is designed to negate that essentially by by essentially forcing the offense to not be able to have one player that just sits behind the en the enemy defense okay because that player Our is yeah so that, that player is not an eligible pass recipient while they are behind the enemy defense as long as the ball is in front of the enemy defense Okay, okay. As soon as someone travels with the ball past the enemy defense, that player is now in play and is a legal pass target. Okay, okay, okay. That has got to be wild for the ref to keep keep track of. It is, and that is why the assistant refs that run along the side paths here are so important to be able to call offsides. Because generally, they will try to keep pace with wherever that last defender is so that they mm. know where that line is so that they can make that judgment call because it, it happens in an instant. No and kidding. It's gotten to the point in it's gotten to the point now where we have the technology that we can essentially like 
almost pixel perfect set a like one centimeter ish line down the field using our camera technology to know where that defensive player is and how far over that line that offensive player is at the time the ball was kicked Jeez. and if any part of that offensive player hands or feet i should say or body i guess is past that mm -hmm. line that's offsides okay <laughs> okay do you see how it's sure. the most confusing rule in the game <laughs> did you see how long it took me to understand what you were talking about yeah <laughs> kidding now here's why it's the most bullshit rule in the game <laughs> <laughs> and i'm gonna get fired right. for this but lost. bring it on uh what it does so it's intended to stop cherry picking but what it does is it then encourages the defense to play out of position. Mm. They're trying to stay as far, far back, I guess. It encourages them to play forward. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes because sense. Because if they sense. can Sorry. trap someone off sides, it doesn't matter if they get the ball and score. It doesn't count. Hmm. As long as they remain off, as long as the shot remains as an offside shot. You know, I wonder. There were a couple times. I mean, granted, I was up in the stands and it was kind of hard to see. I was a little far away from the jumbotron, so it was kind of hard to to really see. But I could have sworn in the game that I went to last week, there were a couple of goals that got shot, and I didn't see the score go up and i was very confused so i just kind of chalked it up to i didn't actually see it correctly which could have still been the case but it was probably but, an but, but shot damn okay because it, it, it happens a lot and there's actually a big problem right now uh at least in the premier league i don't know about many of the other leagues but there's a big problem where um assistant refs will wait to call off sides so even if a shot is technically off sides and the players go and score a goal and start celebrating, sometimes the assistant reps will wait to actually raise their flag to call it off sides. Hmm. And that's become a big problem because not only does that waste game time for the teams, uh, that also to quite literally everyone there puts this distrust in the referees mm, mm, mm -hmm. which is real bad <laughs> not that you know passionate fans have a lot of trust in the referees to begin with or so it seems uh it's that is kind of, so that's kind of one of the nice things about soccer and especially games like the uh or tournaments like the world cup um, I believe in this last World Cup, there were 40 referees hailing from all of the different countries that were playing and even a few countries that weren't playing. Mm -hmm. um, so that in any given situation, in any given game, they could have an impartial ref on the game. Someone to whom, even through their national pride, made zero difference who won the game. Makes sense. That's smart. That's really smart. It doesn't happen as often in the actual in actual league play because obviously they no. can't exactly hire entirely impartial people. But I'm if say someone limited is, resources, I'm sure. Right, but generally, if someone if a ref is a fan of a certain team, they won't ref or won't be allowed to ref for that team. Makes sense, makes sense. They want it to be as impartial as possible because temper tempers flare against the refs. It happens every single game, pretty much after any major decision is called or any injury is called, you will see players go up to the ref and start talking to them 
trying mm-hmm. to figure out what the heck happened why didn't you call this blah 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 blah. and you know, sometimes they'll get in the face of the ref and start yelling mm-hmm. at the ref and it happens every single game um, because these are such important matches for these people this is the it's yeah. the number one sport it's the most watched sport these people are making uh so much money if their team does good the teams have to do good to make the money <laughs> uh still there did i lose you oh hang on chat we're having issues oh no <laughs> oh no he died <laughs> uh we did it chat <laughs> We got him. <laughs> the offsides broke his brain. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> well, while we wait, <laughs> let's uh let's get back to that FIFA match, shall we? <laughs> while we wait for him to return, I'm surprised that. So this is a uh, FIFA 20 or I guess 21, maybe I don't even remember which one is it. 20. Um, I'm surprised that Arsenal and Man City are so tightly matched. This is the third game now they've they've gone one in one. <laughs> now, I'm getting word that his uh, his computer overloaded with soccer knowledge and is malfunctioning. That's OK. Um. <laughs> We're going to we're going to watch this. We're going to watch this game. Um, oh, come on. What foul was that? What's happening? Bama Young for Martinelli. Sure. Oh, he finally just connected from Discord. <laughs> it's all right, chat. It's all right. We'll get him back. We'll get him back for the sports. He can't escape me. (laughs) He can't escape my sports. (laughs) Ah, good stuff. Why have I dropped so many frames? What is happening? Is my CPU fine? You, uh, doing okay over here? Yeah, looks fine. My GPU's uh, it's a, it's a little hot. GPU is a little hot, but not too bad. Yeah, we're doing all right. I don't know why I'm dropping so many frames. I wonder if my Wi-Fi is having an issue, and that's why I'm dropping frames. Um, but yeah, these teams um weren't this closely matched in 2020 as far as i'm aware um arsenal was having a little bit of a rough time they had a good team but they had a rough time actually being able to capitalize on a lot of their players like they weren't they weren't a bad team by any means but i definitely didn't expect them to do this well against man city back in 2020 granted this is all ai generated based off of numbers stats and an algorithm inside of a video game so you know it's only as accurate as a computer can be in predicting stuff and uh for anyone who's still watching while we wait to get dane back on the line um i know he hasn't been able to talk much about uh biodiversity and all of the beautiful things he is working on and all of the knowledge he has about being a marine biologist but if you're interested if you're interested in that stuff go check out his podcast biodiversity you can see it in the bottom right uh, of your screen here it's a wonderful podcast he makes a lot of great jokes during it it's a very it's very easy to get into it's 
uh, very solid podcast. I def definitely recommend it. Like you said, each episode, he picks a new interesting fish to look at and analyze and tell you all the fun facts about. So go check out Biodiversity. And if you want to hear more ocean facts, we are working on being able to do in a uh, collaborative stream in the not too distant future where I will be playing a video game while he overlooks the game and maybe analyzes some of the fishy situations in the game. If that sounds interesting to you, be sure to leave a follow and tag along on my adventures. I stream twice every week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I generally do a variety stream where I just play whatever game suits me on the given day. I like to play a lot with my friends and oh, are we back? Uh, sort of. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I don't know what happened with my computer, but it completely blue screened. Um, and it is working on repairing itself, quote unquote. So I'm on my iPad now. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, sounds like a fun situation. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know what was up with that. It just got overloaded with so much soccer knowledge. I'm full of it. <laughs> Just just couldn't handle it. I think it's because I was trying to run um, an external monitor, too. Um, mm -hmm. My guess is I am now looking at it, and I didn't plug my external monitor into the um, outlet, so it was drawing power from my laptop, and I maybe just overloaded it. Yeah. Um, trying to be. stream and talk and all of that um, all at the same time. So, you know, but in, in, I'll, I'll be back on the computer as soon as that boots up. But if you want to keep talking, I'm here. What's up, buddy? Who's going off, off the rails tonight? <laughs> we're going out. We're going off the cord. We're on battery power now. Let's go. <laughs> oh, baby. Uh, um, well, okay, so we, yeah, so go ahead. What were you going to say? I, I guess uh, I'll just go ahead and ask uh, if you had any more I don't remember exactly what we were talking about after offsides. Do you have any more questions about offsides? <laughs> no, um, it makes sense. Um, it's definitely something I have to keep keep an eye out and like watch for um, in in the future because that is just a very I don't know just a hard thing to to keep track of. It's definitely an interesting rule to try and wrap your head around and. Uh, trust me, it gets even crazier when you're actually having to deal with it. Um, but it, once you know it, and even with just like a simple gist of it, if you watch a few games, I I probably see at least one offsides call in just about every single game. It's actually a fairly common call um, because it's 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 very easy to have occur as an offensive player. I'm sure. I'm very sure. I mean, I would get caught up in the moment and just like be like, oh, look at this guy who's open. I'm going to pass to him. I'm going to get a score. Like, Yep. Yeah. Um, and so it's definitely, but like it, once you kind of know it, you can kind of watch games and kind of watch how it actually plays out in a game. And I've, 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 I will say um, I played soccer from when I was a little kid all the way into middle school. I played it for a long time and it actually took uh, watching some pro games for me to fully grasp the sport. Yeah, there's a lot to it. There is a lot to it and there's there's a lot you can get just from watching it. You know, in all fairness, it's it's a crazy situation. Um, one of the rules that a lot of people uh, kind of miss out on is um, for a goal to actually count as a goal, the entirety of the ball has to go beyond the goal line. Mm, OK, so this line here. So yep, 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 yep. if a ball goes up, it hits the top post, bounces straight down on the goal line and then gets hit out by the goalie. 
That ball is not a fair play. That's not a goal. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so there's a lot of couple. There's a couple of nuanced things with that specifically in soccer. Um, but I remember when you went to your game because we were chatting about it. Because I was honestly surprised you went to a soccer game. <laughs> um, grad school has made me a different person, man. <laughs> Things are different now. Uh, you were messaging me specifically about penalties. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there are, are a couple there there are a couple different penalties that you can accrue in soccer, and there are different seriousnesses of penalties. Um. So you have your minor penalties, which, oh gosh, <laughs> sorry. Um, where did my thing go? You have your minor, minor penalties, uh, which are things of like, what's a good example of a minor penalty here? Um, Like, uh, like uh, tripping someone might be considered yeah. a minor penalty, depending on what happens. Um, uh, tackling someone and or doing a slide tackle and hitting the player instead of the ball might be considered a minor penalty. Accidentally stepping on someone's toes might be considered a minor penalty. Okay. okay. Um, those usually... Uh, result in the ball being given to the um, of uh, not the offender, the offending play. Nope, the offended player. Defended, yeah, yeah. So, so whoever the penalty was against, if 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 you yes. stepped on my toes, my team would get the the control. Yes, and so you are given an indirect kick from the spot of the foul, which an indirect kick means that the first touch of the ball cannot go into the goal. The first touch of the ball? Yes. I guess I don't quite understand. Can you? So um, I guess uh, first touch is a little disconcerting. The player who's taking so uh, essentially when an indirect kick is, is the player who's taking. So uh, when a when a penalty occurs and the team gets the opposing ball, the ball will be set on the on the pitch on the field where the penalty took place. And one person from that team gets to kick the ball to mm-hmm. resume play. In an indirect kick or an indirect kick, uh, that player cannot immediately shoot the ball from the penalties position. Okay. Okay. They have to at least pass it to one other player before a shot before can be taken. Make, making a shot on the goal. Okay. Yes. That makes sense. Um, a direct kick is the opposite where they can just immediately take a shot on the goal. Okay. Uh, these most so, often happen uh, looking in our diagram here. Uh, these most often happen uh, to uh, on the goals quarter of the field. So if okay. red team, if blue team penalized red team on this quarter of the field, basically, mo- mm-hmm. I think most likely, and this I think is also dependent on the severity of the penalty. I'm not entirely sure. But generally, that is going to allow red team a direct kick against the goal. Gotcha. The exception being if the penalty occurs inside of the goal box. Okay. If a penalty incur- occurs inside of the goal box against the offensive team, the offensive team gets to do what is called a penalty kick. Um, for a penalty kick, the offense will get to 
set the ball on this little white square here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and send one player up to kick the ball against only the goalie. 1v1-ing it. 1v1-ing the goalie. Gotcha. Everyone else must stay at least 10 meters away from the ball. Damn. Which generally means they have to stay outside of the goalie box and outside of this goalie circle, which, just like the center circle, is positioned to have a 10-foot radius so centered on the, on the penalty spot. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, that way, right. if the goalie uh, does not catch the ball, and if the ball doesn't go in and instead redirects, no one's immediately there to capitalize on it. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So, so it's a little bit fair for 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 both teams. I mean, that's a huge advantage for the offensive team. Yes. Um, but they want to make it somewhere fair. Okay, that makes sense. Um, it looks like my computer's back up. I'm gonna try switching back over because it looks like my iPad is frozen. Yeah, go ahead. And um, be right. <laughs> yeah. Scuff streams, what are you going to do? Do, 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 do? I can hear you. Uh, Matt, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Indeed. You're not quite back on camera yet. It's still like registering my frozen iPod on your stream. That's weird. That's there. There we go. <laughs> I'm alive. Oh, I'm I know what Okay, I, I've seen. I've seen the problem. <laughs> Excellent. We're fine. <laughs> Everything's fine. Okay, things are good. Sorry, I'm being such a problem child. Ah, uh, that's fine. It's scuff stream, a scuff stream. Post. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's all good. I'm honestly, out of the highlight, you know, right? like, I'm honestly just so happy to be finally talking sports. <laughs> I resisted for so long. As you can tell, I'm very passionate about soccer. I absolutely love the game. Well, it's cool. I mean, even back when we were we were roommates, like I remember with when the World Cup was on, watching soccer with you. But I just I, I still had no idea what was going on. <laughs> and to be honest, I was way more interested in Animal Crossing at the time. But weren't we all? Um, Everyone was interested in Animal Crossing at the time. <laughs> Um, not, you know, using that as an excuse for not expanding, <laughs> but, um, yeah. So, okay. So let's see. So that was, so, so just, just to recap, um, because yep. I'm probably going to get this wrong. So the minor, minor ish penalties would lead to the, these like indirect cases. Do I have that right? So minor penalties usually just minor and uh, some major penalties usually just lead to either an indirect kick or a direct kick. Um, that is almost entirely dependent on the ball's position on the field and the At team in uh, the team receiving the penalty. Okay. So that's not as severe as a yellow card or a red card. No. So a yellow card is considered a uh, so a yellow card is called a caution. And these are given for these can be given for repeated fouls. Uh, for unsportsmanlike behavior, like trying to trick the referee, um, mm -hmm. arguing with the referee. Uh, taking an action that will purposefully delay the game or uh, even um, taking a substitution without alerting the referee. OK, OK. Um, for any for every substitution, the referee must be alerted that a substitution is being made and you can only substitute while the ball is considered out of play. Um. So you're not going to have players just running off the field and swapping in in the middle of play like you would in a hockey game. The ball has to be con 
considered out of play and or dead so that no action is happening during the time of substitution. Okay. Okay. Um, and then on to the other ones, like arguing with the ref. Like I said, a lot of the times with penalties, you'll see players run up and start arguing with the ref. If it gets to a point where the ref is just essentially done trying to explain them why they're wrong, they can give out a yellow card right. to that player. Okay. And that's essentially a sign of back off. Mm -hmm. I'm not changing my ruling back off. Interesting. That, that doesn't it's, happen nearly as much as the other things like repeated fouls or faking. Mm -hmm. um, which soccer has been called a, uh, to use a not a great term here, wuss game. Mm. Because it's that mentality of anything you can do to deny the opposing team of time you should do mm -hmm. which generally means a lot of players will overreact to Dangerous. injuries or contact because they're trying to either force a penalty or force or a the delay of the game so that the other team doesn't get as much time to do things interesting okay but if someone's clearly faking it just to try and do that, that can impose a yellow card. Right. So it's trying to in that instance, it's trying to keep the game going. The ref's job is to keep the game going. Okay. As well as keep it a fair game. Um, so a yellow card is a caution. Mm hmm. How many yellow so, cards so do you go ahead? Sorry, real quick. Um, what was my question? Um, you mentioned <laughs> that a lot of it is for like repeated fouls, right? Because um, mm -hmm. one of the, the few yellow cards that were issued in the game that, that I saw um, seemed to be, at least to me, from like tripping that sort of type of, of foul where it's like I would see players collide some people get tripped up in the in the foot and then I mean you would see players go tumbling or, or sliding on the ground I mean it, it looked like it hurt um type of thing and I wasn't quite clear on like sometimes something happened and players just got up and sometimes there was a yellow card that was issued so I was trying to figure out like why like what the determining factor was the only thing I could come up with was like okay if there's like clear intent behind like trying to trip somebody so I guess my, my question is, do refs look for intent like that? Do they see if like they see there's a very clear like, oh, I reached out and tried to trip you and that's the first time that's like a yellow card or is it more just repeatedness of the, the foul? I feel like that question didn't make any sense. That, that actually makes perfect sense um, because this is a common thing that actually refs do kind of have to be aware of. So as you probably saw during the match, in some of these attempts, what players were trying to do most likely is what's called a slide tackle, where essentially you try to get low to the ground and sliding with like one foot out in front of the other to take the ball essentially out from under your opponent. OK, um, it is a legal move as long as. Two main things take place. Um, you make contact with the ball before making contact with the player, and you cannot slide tackle from behind. Okay, okay. And so this is slide tackling is a heated issue because it's a safety thing. Um, you've got these people with these powerful legs and spiked shoes yeah, sliding say, towards other players that if you miss the ball and just slam into someone's ankle, there's a good chance you're going to at least roll their ankle, if not straight up break it. Yeah, no kidding. And if you're doing it from behind, they can't see you coming. Mm -hmm. So that's even more dangerous, because if you're coming from the front, the, most of the times you'll see someone sliding in and an opposing player will try to just jump it. They'll try to pop the ball up and jump it so that neither them or the ball gets hit and it right. often ends 
it, it often ends up not working like that and someone gets tipped and goes tumbling and the ball gets shot out into the middle of nowhere um Trying so it's stuff. it's a safety thing um and severity is a big part of that uh a yellow cards like just just tripping someone once isn't probably going to net you a, a yellow card but if you are repeatedly tripping someone especially the same person that becomes a safety hazard you're going to get a yellow card mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay so it's the yellow cards they are a little bit more judicious and um they're mm -hmm. careful about issuing them that makes sense they're careful about issuing them and they're most refs are very reserved when it comes to yellow cards um, you will not see a ref handing out yellow cards willy-nilly in a game. Um, there are games where a lot of yellow cards occur, though. Specifically, I remember from the Men's World Cup, um, Argentina's semi-final game, they got, like, five yellow cards in a single game amongst various mm. players. Yeah, not right. good. There were a lot of penalties flying that game. Um, I'm honestly surprised that uh, what we're going to talk about next didn't happen at least once. Um, but so my question to you is, how many yellow cards do you think you can get as a player? It's two, right? Yep. So if any individual player receives two yellow cards, they instead receive a red card, which is an expulsion from the game. Like permanently, I'm assuming, at least for the rest of the game. For the rest of the game. That also yeah. means your team plays a man down for the rest of the game. Oh, dang. OK. Mm hmm. They don't so get it's to not replace like... that player. Dang. OK, so like because because I mean, what comes to mind, obviously, is like hockey, right, where you can have somebody out on the sideline, but the penalty is only like three minutes or something like that. And then they can can jump back in. That's harsh. So so you can have a 10 to the 11 type of thing. Yep. So it's it. You definitely don't want to get a red card, which is why that first yellow card is such a big back off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No and such kidding. a powerful it's a very powerful tool in the ref's pocket. Um, oh. Very very rarely will a ref go immediately to a red card. Those are usually, uh, I believe, I've only seen that done once. And mm. it was for ex uh, explicit um, malintent. Basically, someone, someone was actively trying to cripple someone on the enemy team Jeez. so they got a straight red card and were expelled i mean that that makes sense yeah wow. red, very i you will almost never see just a straight red card immediately it will usually be at least one yellow then the second which equals a red mm -hmm. um So, so does does yeah. anything particularly happen when that first yellow card is issued, other than just like back off, don't do what you just did again type of thing? Um, it's not like there's an actual penalty within the game, like okay, yellow card issued, now the opponent gets control of the ball type of thing. So the the key thing about yellow cards and red cards is they are on top of a penalty. Um, oh, right, 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 right. OK, yeah. So a penalty will a penalty will occur or a foul will occur. And based on the severity and the type of foul, the referee will issue a yellow card okay. if required. OK, that makes sense. For some reason, I was like separating the two in my mind, like, OK, penalty, yellow card, two different things. It makes sense that they're just a layer on top. Yep. Like a nice little penalty cake. 
And so one of the things to also keep in mind, though, with penalties is they're not always actions against specific individuals. Um, there's all there's a lot of talk about only being able to use your feet in a game unless you're the goalie. Mm -hmm. If you use your hands to stop the ball, that is a foul. That is a penalty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you use your hands intently to stop the ball, that is a potential yellow cardable offense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you are actively disobeying the rules to actively stop the other team from a potential scoring opportunity. Right, right. If you... I mean, I was learning soccer. That was like the one thing they were doing. Like, do not ever, ever, ever use mm -hmm. strength. Right? That's like, that's like, if you're going to know one thing about soccer, that's the thing that you know about soccer. And like, you'll, you'll see professional players when they line up to form a wall to block a direct kick that's not a penalty kick on the field. They'll usually either line up with their backs facing the ball with their hands in front of them or with their chest facing the ball with their hands behind them so that mm -hmm. if, if the ball ricochets off their body, it doesn't touch their hands. Makes sense. And just immediately give away another foul. Because even if you're but, not... But it is... Oh, go ahead. Uh, even if you're not actively using your hands to block the ball, if the ball touches your hands, it's a foul. Right. That makes sense. But it is legal to um, like redirect the ball using your head. And I've seen like people use their chests before. Is that yep. correct? Anything except essentially shoulder down. Well, uh, right. bicep down because you can use your shoulder. Right. That's your right. shoulder. Totally I've seen legal. people like, you know, that the ball comes and it like hits their chest and they use that to like either redirect it or, or bring it back down to the to the ground. Any part of your body is legal except bicep down, basically. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. And there's actually a fun instance with this uh, that gets called up a lot. And it's kind of like a big controversy. Um, I don't know the exact situation of when this happened, uh, if anyone wants to go and uh, look this up. Just look up... Uh, soccer or football and the hand of god <laughs> so deus ex machina so what happened and i'm probably going to mess up a lot of the details of this uh what happened is there was a uh game i believe between mexico and one of the other countries so it was like an international game and in the last few seconds of the game uh mexico managed to score a goal off of a corner kick uh, however, the goal was scored by one of the players on Mexico's team hitting the ball into the goal with their hand. OK. But even after it's reviewing really the goal, it was called a legal goal and the team won because of it. And when questioned about it, the offending player who used his hand said he scored the goal with the hand of God. <laughs> okay interesting so so basically it just it boiled down to they couldn't prove that he used his hand at the time no they could not prove that he used his hand upon further review and years since he used his hand <laughs> okay yeah i have the wikipedia page pulled up here um it would, looks like argentina versus england argentina, 1986 yeah. world cup uh, the goal was illegal. The goal's name derives from Maradona's initial response on whether he scored it illegally, stating that it was made with a little with the head of Maradona and a little with the hand of God. Mm -hmm. It's <laughs> it's a really funny story to look into <laughs> and uh, a hilarious part of uh, soccer history. <laughs> that is that is great. That is, I mean, obviously not great that it was an illegal goal, but like. Wild, wild, uh, absolutely wild. You know, it's gonna be a trivia question sure. that I'm gonna like now get right <laughs> at some point. Look at you learning stuff. <laughs> I'm learning my horizon. Well, it's funny because I've been I've been going to this is a total aside, but 
I've been going to trivia recently with some of my friends and I am just so weak when it comes to sports and like Bible stuff and like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Just like there, there are areas in trivia that I know that I'm just like so weak on. I mean, I guess you can say Bible stuff because that hasn't really been, been coming up, but like, like sports, um, weirdly, like history is a weird one that I've not been very, very good at. Like, so it's like just these things that I'm trying to expand my mind on. Mm-hmm. Totally not a reason for me being here is to win <laughs> trivia. But here I am. Hey, you know, soccer trivia is a thing. There's a lot. There's a lot less trivia having to do with the actual rules of soccer and a lot more having to do with some famous, well, excuse me, famous matches and players and incidents in soccer. But uh, there's a lot that can just be gleaned by watching soccer and you'll get a lot more enjoyment of watching it if you actually know what's going on and all that goes on behind the scenes. Yeah. Which uh, one of the last pieces I want to touch on uh, because it involves penalties and I know I knew penalties were going to be this kind of big thing to explain is uh, stoppage time. Okay, I've heard the term, no idea what it means. So you probably saw this in the game that you went to see where it wasn't actually a 90 minute game. The first half maybe went to 47 minutes instead of 45. The second half maybe went to 48 minutes instead of 45, Mm -hmm. resulting in a 95 minute game. Indeed. So stoppage time is the ref's ability to make sure that the player's get a full uh, 45 or 90 minutes of play. So towards the end of each half of a game, depending on how many penalties occurred in the game, um, how many uh, throw-ins, how many corner kicks, how many goal kicks, how many goals were scored during the game, essentially any stoppage of play Uh, gets noted by the ref and calculated by some means unknown to me. I think half the time they're just BSing a number anyways. Um, But it gets calculated and added into stoppage time, where at the end of the half, the ref will give a number to the sideline and they'll usually hold up a big old sign that says like three or four or what we saw a lot in the world cup was like seven and eight Mm -hmm. and that's how many more minutes you have past the 45 to continue playing before the half is actually over gotcha okay and this is called stoppage time and the reason i specifically brought up the world cup is uh, more often than not, you will only see a stoppage time between two and five minutes. The World Cup was fun. Uh, at least the previous men's World Cup was fun because majority of the matches had seven to nine minute stoppage time averages. Dang. Which is almost well, unheard of. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, now that you're mentioning it, there was an eight minute stoppage time. Um, in, in the game that I went to, mm-hmm. but um, it, so so I guess I guess the the question is, I, which doesn't sound like you quite know. It's not just a one to one of like, okay, the game was stopped for X number of minutes, and that's how many minutes of stoppage time. So like an actual calculation that happens. I mean, even if you don't know the calculation, or is it? As far as I'm aware, it's not like an actual calculation because there's no set time for anything it doesn't take say not every throw in is going to take say 10 seconds for the ball to get back in play sometimes they'll take two seconds sometimes they'll take 11 seconds it's not consistent right um each goal celebration is going to be different depending on the situation a goal that puts your team at one toe is going to be a lot different than a goal that puts your team two to two Mm -hmm. um the celebration is going to be bigger for the two to two. And then the proceeding three to two is going to be even bigger of a celebration. Um, so uh, as, as far as I'm aware, having never reffed, there is no set time. Uh, there's no set calculation for gotcha. it. 
it's all situation dependent and even then uh even if you play through a match say you get to your 45 minutes you get two minutes of stoppage time you play to that two minutes but your team is still in an attacking position on the goal the ref's not going to call the game in the middle right. of your attacking chance they are going to wait for the ball to be cleared to a position where it is obviously no longer a scoring opportunity before they call the game. Okay. Okay. So even, even the stoppage time is fluid. The end of a match is always fluid, which is partially why trying to take that time off of your opponent is so important. Right. So question then follow up mm -hmm. um is overtime a thing for tied scores or is it just stoppage time so that depends on the type of match for a regular season match there is no overtime um the match will be called as a draw if the if the team is tied at the end of the game Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for tournament play um, past group stages into actual tournament stages uh, I believe at half you go or I believe if you are tied at the end of a match you go into if it's not the final I believe you go immediately into penalties um, you go you go into a penalty shootout. Oh, okay. Like if it if it is the final, you go into uh two I think it's fifteen minute halves after the game oh, okay. and then into penalties if you're still tied. Interesting. So it all I, depends on whether or not you like it's acceptable to have a tie, it kinda sounds like. Like if the yeah, game Yeah, let me tie. Let me double check that real quick. Ba, 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 well, well, while we are doing that, I'll explain why I'm asking the question. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The game that I went to, I got super like hyped because our team, um, the San Diego Warriors, basically we were we were down a goal and literally at you know 89-59, like I shit, you know, like 89-59, we hit and got a, and scored a goal, like literally the last second. Um, so I was like super hype. We tied it up in the last last second, and I just assumed, being the noob that I am, that it was because we had tied it up in the last second that we then got our eight or whatever minutes of of overtime. But it sounds like that was more of a stoppage time thing than overtime. Mm -hmm. Wild. I mean, still hype that we tied it up in the last second, but. Yeah, so most likely the eight minutes you saw was the extra stoppage time that occurred for X number of penalties, goals, et cetera, that happened yeah. throughout that specific half. That makes sense. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, stoppage is always added on the half for the half. So penalties that occur in the first half will not affect the second half's stoppage time. Correct. They will affect the first half's stoppage time. Cool. Okay. Um, Makes sense. Makes sense. So yeah, I, I just double checked uh, in tournament play. Once you are outside of group stages, because group stages count draws still. Um, once you're outside of group stages, it goes to uh, two 15 minute halves. Um, so you essentially get 30 plus minutes to try and get another goal. If that doesn't occur, then you go into a penalty shootout. Um, now, a penalty shootout, we go back to our fun little diagram. Go back, diagram. And I'm going to move over to this right side here. So it each is. team. Hmm? I'm just being silly. OK. Um, you know, what? actually, we're just going to. Freshen up here. 
So in the penalty shootout, uh, each team will select five. Whoa, you can't see that at all. There we go. Uh, five players. So you have your five uh, blue players and your five whoa, red players. And you're generally going to want these to be the best scorers on your team. Yeah. Because what they're going to be doing is each one is going to go uh, one at a time, alternating up against the opposing team's goalie as if it were a standard okay. penalty shot. Gotcha. And penalty shot, not goal kick. Goal yep. kicks the other way. And the other teams will will usually just kind of line up along center field, or the the other their teammates and opposing players will just line up on center field and then watch. Um, so red would go up and shoot against blue first. Uh, then the red goalie would swap in. The first blue player would come up, and blue would shoot against red, and you alternate back and forth. Okay, that makes sense. Until somebody scores, hopefully it's inside the match. Until majority is scored. Which means if you are tied at the end of five penalty shots per team, you go into another round of five. Oh, okay. okay. Because you are in a situation that cannot have a draw, so you have to determine a winner. Makes sense. So, so you, you want to keep... make sure it has enough chances to, to make it even. That makes sense. Yep. Um, and so these, this is where you'll definitely see the... Usually the goalies specifically try to implement every single mind game. Oh, excuse me. Every single mind game trick that they have from showboating after blocking a goal to making weird faces and moving back and forth the jittery before the opposing player gets to take a shot. Mm -hmm. uh, because since since the penalty spot is so close to the goal. Goalies majority of the time have to do that thing I was talking about earlier where they have to predict yeah. where the ball is going. Yeah, that is that's harsh on the goalies, man. Mm -hmm. And if you watch the uh, World Cup finale game, at least I'm pretty sure this was the finale and not the semifinals because it's all a little bit of a blur. Um, Argentina and France, because I believe this was the finale game, Argentina and France went into a penalty shootout for the title of World Cup. And Argentina's goalie was so good at the mental game that what they forced the French team to do in those penalty shootouts was insane to watch. Because they look that up. If you can find that video, you should send it my way because that would be. I wild. imagine it's on. I hope it's on YouTube. Uh, FIFA World Cup 2020. Nope, not 2050, 22. 2022 final. Yeah, so they yeah, so they they tied three to three in the match, and in penalties, Argentina went four to two. In penalties. Wow. <laughs> wow. Huge. Okay. That's that's impressive. Huge game. Three shots. Wow. 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 Yeah. Huge. Huge game. It was, uh, like I said, Ar Argentina's goalie had the moves. It was such a crazy thing to watch. Um, just a absolutely mind mind boggling. 
trying to see if I can get this to load. I don't know if this will have everything in the shootouts in it or not. Kind of doubt it. That's regular game. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. This is a, uh, oh, I've locked your camera. Come back. There we go. Um, so this is, a, this is a free video you can find on the FIFA website. Um, so the blue team is France. The goalie in green back here is Argentina. Um, one of the interesting things about soccer is the goalie has to be in a different color from the rest of the team. Yeah, I noticed that. Um, just it, it's mainly to make them stand out for the ref's sake so mm -hmm. that they can easily identify if someone has their hands on the ball. Oh, they're supposed to. They're the goalie because they're in this outrageous color. Um, so the uh, Argentina generally wears a uh, white and like a sky blue. France is this gold and navy blue. Um, but the Argentina goalkeeper is in uh, green, and I think the France goalkeeper was in orange. Right, 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 right. I'm a boom save. And you can Oof. see afterward, he like immediately went to a celebration. Boom, goal, because the goalie dove the wrong way. Taking off the shirt in celebration, getting into the mental game against the enemy team, cheering. Yeah. Like, Man, um, look at that face. Just... So, uh, this is a regular match. Come on. So, Block's going right here. You can see immediately gets up, is basically charging the other player, jumping in the air. Yeah, getting pumped, getting his team pumped and at the same time demoralizing the other team. Yeah. Huh. It's a whole other layer of the strategy. Mm hmm. Penalty shootouts are completely separate strategy from the rest of the game entirely. Wow. It is entirely a one on one between you and the goalie. Wild. It's it's some crazy stuff. I wish I could find Whoa. a full VOD of that game. I recommend anyone to go watch it. It is a piece of soccer history. Um, it was Lionel Messi's probably last game playing for Argentina in the World Cup, and he managed to win the World Cup. Way to go, Lionel Messi. You are an amazing player, and you will be missed in the world of soccer and football. We, a fantastic player. He's won just about every single achievement a player can win including now the World Cup in his last year. That, that is fantastic. I mean, absolutely. Even I've heard player. of him. So, like, yeah, not saying that's an honor that I've heard of him, but, like, <laughs> you know. Well, I would hope that Lionel Messi is almost a household name at this point. He, <laughs> they have done so much. He deserves it. They, he absolutely deserves it. He's done so much over the years in soccer. Just absolutely ridiculous player. There was this huge debate that's been going on of like if Lionel Messi was better than Cristiano Ronaldo and like who is the actual better player. And it's like Ronaldo's got all of these goals and stats and whatnot, but Lionel Messi's actually got all the trophies to back it up. It's a, it's a huge thing. Um, a lot of people, myself included, are kind of bummed that we didn't get to see them actually really face off in the World Cup. Um, I think that definitely would have been one for the ages since it's definitely Lionel Messi's last World Cup and probably also Cristiano Ronaldo's last one as well. Mm. Um, well, we did get to see, though, Messi versus... Uh, I can't remember his first name, but Mbappe from the French team. Um, mm. We'll be seeing plenty more of Mbappe, though. He's... He's got a lot of years on him still to play. Um, so we're not we're not done with him yet. He's another fantastic player. Uh, so so question, 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 question. Yeah, because I'm full of them. <laughs> um, 
fantastic. How does team building work? I know like in football, I do not understand it at all, but I know there's like player drafting. Um, does that happen in soccer at all? Or is it just like once you're on a team, that's your team? Um, so once you're on a team, you are not stuck on that team. So it, it is kind of it is a job. Um, so there are contracts, there are negotiations. Uh, players have left teams to go to better teams because money or they like that team better. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the I don't know the full logistics of any sort of a draft. Uh, for soccer, um, that might be something they do here in the U.S. Uh, the Premier League, which is the league that I m mostly follow, um, it's a lot of just trading or signing contracts. Um, teams are often looking to fill positions because players either get too old and retire or... Uh, move to another team because they think it will give them a better opportunity. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of contract negotiation and it, it all usually happens off season. Sure. Um, there is the occasional instance where a player will get traded in the middle of the season, uh, but that doesn't happen often unless it's an injury, I believe. Um, the big thing about the Premier League, though, is the so what's the best way to put this so kind of looking at like the nfl so you've got the nfl teams and then the college teams that the nfl teams look at to draft players out of now imagine if one of those college teams ended up doing so much better than the other college teams and better than the worst NFL team that those teams swapped places. Mm -hmm. So that college team is now an F NFL team and that NFL team is now a college team. That's kind of how the Premier League works. So each season, the three worst teams in the Premier League get put up for what's called relegation. Um, the premier, if the Premier League is like the top of this giant pyramid of different leagues that happen in the UK, well, not the UK, in England. Mm -hmm. um, and as as a team does better, they will be able to graduate from their bracket up to the next bracket via a mm -hmm. tournament mm -hmm. against those relegated teams. OK. So that's kind of one of the interesting things about the Premier League is every single season you might see three new teams that haven't either haven't been there before or haven't been there in a while that suddenly come on and start taking the stage by storm and are suddenly doing they, really good. And gotcha. uh, and like you, you've definitely got your legacy teams in the Premier League. Arsenal's been around for forever. Chelsea's been around for forever. Manchester City, Manchester United, Leicester, uh, Tottenham. So many teams have been in the Premier League for so long that it's very surprising to see any of them doing bad enough to even get close to going into relegation. Right. But it's always a possibility. It's always a possibility, but people kind of forget about that for those teams because it's like, oh, Arsenal's been in the league for forever. They'll never get relegated. And then they have a horrible season and get really close to being relegated for half of the season before being able to bounce back. And it's it's this thing that like until it happens, a lot of people don't pay attention to it unless it's their team. Makes sense. Makes sense. So th that's kind of like it's that's like less of a draft um, and more of just a way that the league kind of makes sure that it's showing off the best of the best that it has to offer. It is the premier league, so it has to show premier soccer. Makes sense. Makes sense. So how did you 
particularly personal story, choose your favorite team. So I went about this in the dumbest way possible. <laughs> yes, let's um, go. So uh, a lot of the times you pick your team because you have some s sort of tie to that team. Like, for instance, sure. I'm a Denver Broncos fan. I live in Colorado. I've lived in Colorado my whole life. I love it here. I root for the Broncos because they are Colorado's team. I'm always going to root for the Broncos because they're the team I've known my whole life. I obviously don't live in the UK or in Europe anywhere. So I have zero ties to any of the teams over there. Mm -hmm. Like just none. I've got a buddy who I work with who is a fan of Chelsea because he's from uh, Belgium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he grew up with a lot of ties to Belgium and he likes the Chelsea team because of that. I when I was very young and both me and my brother were playing soccer uh, as kids, there was a program that you could get into called Arsenal Soccer. It was yeah. essentially an uh, I hate to call it an elite program, but there it was a different league than the league I played in, which was just a recreational league. And sure, sure, sure. Uh, my brother tried out for soccer, got on to one of the teams because you had to do all of these tryouts. And then depending on how well you did at tryouts, you got set at, at a different Arsenal level. It was like Arsenal, like gold, silver, blue, purple, red, something like that. Yeah, and I think a very he got, sensical color scheme. Yeah, I think he got said in Arsenal purple or blue. I don't quite remember how it worked. But like, so when I was a kid, the word Arsenal to me meant good because he was ah. a good player. He got put <laughs> onto the good league of the Arsenal League. I was a bad player. I played rec. I never got put into Arsenal. I never even tried out for Arsenal soccer. So... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I love everything about this. This is just so you, and I love it. So many years later in high school, because um, this happened back when I was still in elementary school, super young. Many years later, I had been done playing soccer for at least three years. Um, just because I got held up in other stuff. I do kind of wish I'd stuck with soccer a lot longer. But with so many other things going on in my life, like orchestra and uh, like your robotics and eventually science Olympiad, I just never really had the opportunity to get back into it. And I have lost all of my skill. <laughs> um, but in, in, high school, in high school, in high school, I got back into like very loosely following professional soccer. And I happened upon a uh, Premier League game, and I think it was between uh, Arsenal and Tottenham, the mm. Tottenham Spurs. And I saw Arsenal on the screen, and I was like, oh, Arsenal, that's the thing my brother did. That's cool. I'll root for them. Completely not completely associating exactly arsenal the team to arsenal the league <laughs> that's well, in my you know, state because it, it, it's the name was spelled the exact same the symbol was the exact same even the um mascot the cannoneers was the exact same so I just saw that and went oh arsenal that's cool I'll root for them they seem to be doing well in this game and I, I watched the it's game fun, and obviously. it was, I watched the game and Arsenal won. And I was like, all right, cool. Yeah. Arsenal. I could probably follow them. Yeah. And then I once again, disassociated myself from soccer for a long time <laughs> and into well into college, actually, um, before I really picked it up again. And at that point, uh, Arsenal was kind of starting to hit their peak. So they were playing mm. really well. And so I got back into them and I watched Arsenal be playing really well. This was around uh, 2014 or so, 2015. 
And so I watched them play well, and I was like, all right, this team's good. I'm going to kind of get behind the hype of this team. I think I'm, this is going to be my team because you want to see your team do well. And it was a team I had a, albeit disassociated, mental tie to. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, all right, this is my team. And they immediately started playing real bad. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. I think for the next oh, it had to have been it felt like at least four years or so they mm. were a very middle of the road team <laughs> they started doing they like they weren't really in danger of being relegated but they were no longer one of the talking point teams and that's right. of course when I started getting back kind of big into them and only recently did they actually start making good plays and good trades. And they got us. They have. To, huh, I'm going to gush. So <laughs> this last season that just ended not too long ago, the 2022 2023 season is the best arsenal I have seen in a long time. We had we finally got a great coach. We had a great captain and we had the team to back both of those up. And like we had a few players that we uh, got the trades in that were supposed to be really good. And they ended up making stupid mistakes that took them out of games for a long series of time. But it's fine because surprisingly, while they were out of the games, we still managed to play. I don't know how, but we still managed to do well. And we were on the top of the board for so long. But the problem was we would get up to the top and we would be sitting at the top and we would get like a comfortable lead because it's all about this points thing that I don't really want to go into because it's very complicated. But we'd be at the Another top. stream, perhaps. We'd be at the top, we'd get this like massive lead, and then we'd just we wouldn't lose games, but we would draw games instead of winning them. Mm. Or we'd lose like one game and then draw two or three of them, which meant freaking Manchester City, which is why I picked them for that FIFA game, because screw them. Freaking Manchester City was able to work their way up the leaderboard to the point where they were they were essentially like one game behind us and we mm. had been at the top for majority of the season. They were one game behind us and we fumbled three games in a Ooh. row. No, just completely blew it for three games in a row out of the last like six games of the season. Oh, and Manchester God. passed us and then we we won we kept we started winning again so the hope was almost there and then in i think in the last three games of the season it, we went like loss loss win or something like that uh premier league standings uh 2022 2023 yeah we went loss loss win and they went loss they went draw loss which only meant they were five points ahead of us, which is just two victories for Arsenal. Oh. And we would have reclaimed our number one spot and we would have had it this year. This was our year to win and we blew it. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> mad. <laughs> I'm so mad. Yeah. Like, oh, we were there. You can see. So uh, matches played is the 38 here. Wins 28 to 26, super close. Draws five to yeah. six, super close. Losses five to six, super close. Goals four. They had us beaten that. That's fine. We weren't the we weren't the highest scoring team. That's not what Arsenal was this year. We didn't need to be the highest scoring team. We were winning games. That's all that mattered. Well, if I've learned anything this whole stream, it's you don't have to be a you know high scoring thing. You don't have to be. That that only would have come into play if it came down to this goal difference column right here, um, which is basically the difference between the goals you got versus the goals that were scored against you is mm -hmm. equals your goal difference. Um, gotcha. And that is that is used to break ties in placement. Yeah. Makes so sense. if we had tied in points, then the goal difference would have been the, the difference maker. But like, uh, uh, I'm going to get into it. Basic concept, um, you get three points for a win, one point for a draw, zero points for a loss. 
So, so if these two had been wins, we would have had six more points and beaten Man and City by them. one. Rough. And we blew it. <laughs> there was a time where we had them by like a solid nine points. Solidly oh, ahead. And we just started blowing it. <laughs> I mean, it I'm sure it's so the, um, the light of Man City fans, but. Because this, this literally happened in like the last 10 games of the season. Out I'm of sure, 38 yeah, were... games. That's wild. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because I didn't quite comprehend um, the number of games that are being played here. Like, I mean, having just that record of you know a 26 to 6 to 6 type of thing like that's impressive that's mm -hmm. really impressive yep 38 games in a regular season um obviously tournament play is different and not calculated sure, in this sure, but sure. yeah it's wow uh, yeah that's awesome Dang. and you well, can kind of see here if i scroll down this this is the relegation area. So the last three teams are the ones that get put up into relegation. And as you can see, they usually don't have the best records. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't look like it. Oof. Yeah. They got beat and they got beat a lot. So they will get put into a tournament with the top um, seven teams of the league below. And yeah. They'll battle it out to see who gets to come into uh, next season's Premier League. So when does next season's Premier League start? <sighs> Soon-ish. Soon-ish. Excellent. And then the, the Women's World Cup um, is starting soon as well. July 20th. Go check it out. Go watch the FIFA Women's World Cup. Um, if you're in the U.S. support team USA, we are at the chance of making history. I think you heard this in my intro, but we could be the first team ever to win three World Cups in a row in both men in out of any of them. No team in men's has done. No team in women's has done it. We've been close. We got really close. Japan messed us up, but we were really close to doing it before we could do it again. I believe in us three games in a row. Let's go U.S. women's team. I believe in you. As you can see, I have so much passion for this. Well, you got another fan here. Like, I'm I'm ready to go. Like, invite me over. I'll be back in Colorado, uh, hopefully for, for a couple games. So, like, let's let's watch some soccer. Let's see if I can apply anything I've learned tonight and and actually sound halfway decent about what I'm talking talking about. August eleventh hey, is when for, the, for August eleventh is the Premier League starts up again. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. cool. Which I think will be chasing nope i don't think the world cup will be quite over by then that's gonna be like the final five matches of the world cup that's gonna really suck <laughs> i don't lot. know if i can choose <laughs> i was gonna say that's a lot of soccer going on a lot of, a lot of football, uh, and of course guess. arsenal plays on the second day screw you nottingham forest get out of here <laughs> yeah Arsenal's already predicted mm -hmm. already predicted to be the second Well, that's exciting. I'm I'm stoked. Ooh, Fulham let's, let's got in. That. I don't think they were in last year. Let's go, Fulham. Look at you. Oh no, they were. Yeah, how cool. Okay. Cool. How cool. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Go watch the FIFA Women's World Cup. Even if you're not a fan of the U.S., cheer on your own teams. It's an amazing sport. It's an amazing time. It's it's beautiful people. I, I love it. I love it so much, damn it. <laughs> I'm here for it. Let's go. I mean, you certainly stoked uh, a level of giving a care that I definitely did not have prior to uh any of this because you know me i'm a nerd the whole sports ball thing i'm like <laughs> sports ball but hearing it broken down into this sort of you know strategic and just physical um 
I don't know what the word I'm looking for is the Competition. physical ability, the raw physical ability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and just everything that goes into it from what the refs have to keep track of to what the captains have to keep track of. Oh, no, he died again. <laughs> oh, no, this guy. Oh, no. Oh, are you back? Hello? I should You're be back. back. No, <laughs> Look the at me, you a problem child. <laughs> uh, uh, not to not to stop you and kind of like your ending little tangent there. Um, but, it's hundred uh, percent my fault. I'll be like um, <laughs> better at this next collab. Don't well, don't you worry. Well, I don't I don't quite want to end just yet because there's one more thing I want to um, talk about and. Uh, we we've kind of gone over this a little bit throughout the whole thing and it's what i think of as the fan experience and so i i listen to a decent amount of sports stuff now i wouldn't say i'm still huge on it obviously arsenal plays a lot of their games at stupid early in the morning here in the u.s oh my god um so i can only catch the occasional game um but one thing right but in a lot of sports podcast stuff that I listen to where they do something like we did today, where they go in depth on the game and how everything works and all of the strategy that goes behind it. One thing I'm always missing from that is what I think of as the fan experience, mm -hmm. what it's actually like to be a fan of the sport that they're talking about. Like why someone who isn't super big into sports such as yourself or anyone else who might be watching this stream or this video, why why should this matter to them? What mm -hmm. do they get out of this uh, this thing that they're usually not into watching? And for for me personally, what I get out of it is a sense of hope, excitement, and pride. Mm -hmm. and uh so obviously a lot of it comes down to like whatever team you decide you want to root for and i think that's a little that's kind of where people like have a hard time getting into it is they see all of these teams and they're like well which one should i root for sure. it doesn't have to be anything crazy it can be as simple as somewhere you grew up or just like oh hey i know that word i like that word in the case of arsenal for me I have an association with that word. Let's go Arsenal. It could be even be their mascot. Like um, Arsenal's mask. Arsenal's teams are called the Cannoneers. So if you like cannons, hey, look, a team all about their mascots, Cannoneers. They have cannons. I mean, I, I cannot tell you how many times I have picked a favorite something just because it is marine themed. Yeah. Like, it, even if going over to hockey, which has a lot more Marine-themed stuff, you've got the Seattle Kraken is a team. You've got the Pittsburgh Penguins that are a team. You you don't have to be from a, from that place to root for that team. I am not from, for example, in football, I am not from Green Bay. I root for the Green Bay Packers, as long as they're not playing against the Broncos, because I have friends who like the Packers. So I, I'm going to root for them. I'm going to cheer them on because they're also a team that my friends enjoy. So it it literally can be nothing that gets you into a team. But once you have a team, even if you're just every so often kind of checking in on them, seeing how they're doing, I, I started to develop this kind of sense of pride every time I saw Arsenal 1. I was like, yeah, Arsenal 1, they're doing good. I'm happy to see them doing good. That's cool. And it, it gave me this joy to kind of look into them and follow them and see, oh, this thing, even though I didn't super care about it at the time, I was happy to see that the team I was rooting for was doing good. It gave me a sense of pride. And yeah. then I started checking them more and checking them more. And I started watching games and actually like getting to learn the team, getting to learn the players and just starting to slowly integrate myself into and involve myself with uh this team that i otherwise had no ties to no connection to nothing 
I became invested in them. I got hope whenever I saw them playing of like, OK, we're starting to do good. I'm hopeful that we're going to have a good game this time. And it's I, it's this sense of pride when they start mm. winning. And it's this sense of pseudo accomplishment when they when you see your team ho hoisting that trophy above their head and uh and that like especially with um the women's world cup coming in i think the world cup is a great opportunity for people to support a team that they do have a tie to if mm -hmm. your country is playing in the world cup you have a tie to that team you can root yeah. for that team you can root for your country because they are representing your country representing your national pride in the world cup in a game that's fun to watch fun to enjoy if you if you watch the strategy of it, if you watch how the players think and coordinate on the field, it's it's like watching a ballet or a Cirque du Soleil show when you actually know what's happening and get to see it all come together and mesh into this beautiful sport of soccer. And I I think if just more people would give it a chance, watch the games. And if you're in the U.S., I know it's really hard to watch our own team's games because soccer is hated in the U.S. And I don't know why. But you can watch the Premier League, you can watch the UEFA League, there, you can watch all of the tournaments that U.S. is in almost every year. We're in a decent amount of them now that we're actually doing somewhat decent. But just taking those first couple steps, finding a team that you like for any reason, it's it's an interesting experience and you can try it for a season. If you don't like it, that's fine. You tried it for a season. But I almost guarantee you, you're going to get that little tickle in the back of your brain of like, <laughs> like a few years later, of like, huh, I used to root for the Seattle Krakens. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see how they're doing this year. And you tune in and they're in the Stanley Cup and you're like, holy shit, they're actually doing really good. Well, I kind of want to watch a game. So you see how well they're actually doing and playing and you watch the game and you get engrossed and you get involved with it and you get to feel this pride. You got to talk to someone mm -hmm. next to you. If you go to a game and you're rooting for the same team and this feeling of community and it's just this yes. glorious yes. experience that you're not doing alone, you're in fact doing it with a bunch of other people. You can have friendly little rivalries with your friends of like, oh, I like this team. We're going to beat you since you like this other team. It's it's just fun. And that's that's the fan experience of sports yeah. is that. That camaraderie, that hopefulness, that pride, that fun little rivalry with people that it, it means nothing in the end. You won this time. Cool. I'll beat you next time. It you literally know, means nothing. And it's it's beautiful. Yeah, I, exactly. I don't think in the end it does mean nothing because everything that you spoke about is something that's just so beautiful about sports. Being able to connect with people as humans, the community behind it. I mean the passion is just it's unreal and it's so cool it speaks to what we can be as as human beings so to talk about you know the hope part of what you were talking about it's it's really cool it's really beautiful and even as somebody who has admittedly avoided sports as a point for um a while um i i i see that and it's so cool um you've got yourself you know a new a new soccer fan here i'm i'm ready to watch watch the world cup um i'm, I'm just yeah i'm ready to see what else has in the store i'm, I'm sure the tickle will <laughs> yep and for all of you who watch esports but not actual sports you're still watching sports i see you out there don't sell it's yourself true. short esports is real sports yeah e, e athletes are e E yeah, I'll call me e athletes, even if you call them competitors. They're just as much sports people as anyone else who plays sports. They're just doing it in a fantasy setting that we can't make a reality because that'd just be weird. True. I mean, I tried League of Legends. I was bad. <laughs> There's a lot. That Stay away from League. Stay, Stay away from League. <laughs> I mean, it's right for the right people. It just was not right for me. Okay, that's. Uh, I have a fondness for my league. Omega strikers. I have a fondness I mean, for the don't, league. Don't we all? It's yeah, it's good. Go like, fanatic! You are awesome. I believe in you. Go sports. <laughs> Go sports ball. <laughs> uh, but 
Well, uh, thank you so much for joining me, Dane. It was a pleasure having you and getting to talk sports with you and being able to gush about this thing that I love ever so much uh, with someone who really appreciated and actually took the time to take it all in. I really appreciate you being here. Dude, pleasure is absolutely mine. Like just being able to see the amount of passion that you have for this and Dang, I learned quite a lot tonight. Um, I need to follow up and like have you quiz me on some of this stuff because I, <laughs> I don't want to forget it. I, I really don't. Um, this is this is cool stuff. So well, I was gonna have a, uh, a silly little game for us to play here at the end, but uh, we have gone way too late. Um, so we will have to try that okay. some other time. <laughs> Next stream, perhaps. This will not be the last you see of me. It it will not. Uh, remember, I. I teased a little something partway through the stream while we were having scuff issues, so uh, keep your eyes out for that little stream gremlins. Um, but once again, uh, thank you so much for joining me here on this stream. Uh, that is going to do it for us tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon, night, whatever time it is for you, wherever you happen to be, and I will catch you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye, new friends.